So today I want to talk about polyfilling CSS, specifically the bad parts about it. Uh, and there are a lot of bad parts about polyfilling CSS. And to give you a little bit of context, uh, earlier this spring I wrote an article for Smashing Magazine about Houdini, and I called it the most exciting development in CSS that you never heard of. If you still haven't heard of it, um, just to give you a really brief TLDR, it's a set of low-level APIs that, um, well, Houdini itself is a task force, and their goal is to spec out a bunch of new low-level APIs that will make it easier to do style and layout on the web and give developers low-level access to this stuff that will enable many things, but among them, it'll make it easier to polyfill CSS. And this is really exciting to me um, because I've tried to write a lot of polyfills in my day, and I've had not very much success doing it. So, uh, you know, I wanted to talk about it. And one thing that I realized after I wrote this article, I got a lot of um, questions from people. And a lot of times the question was, so what's so hard about polyfilling CSS? And it occurred to me that if you don't know, or if you've never tried to do it, you might not know why it's hard. So to answer this question, I thought it would be fun to write a polyfill right now on stage today. And so I'm just going to code real quick for like 15 minutes and you guys can watch me. Just kidding. So I was trying to figure out what should we, we should polyfill. I didn't want to pick something real because I really don't want anybody to use the polyfill that we're going to write today. Um, I'm sure some of you probably will, but I strongly encourage you not to. So I wanted to pick something fake. And so I thought, um, make up a new keyword. And the keyword is called random. And random is just a number between 0 and 1. And if you look at this code sample, you can see some usage examples. So like, for example, you would um, random is unit list. So if you wanted to make it, say, a percentage, a random percentage between 0% and 100%, you could set width and use calc to do that. You could use it with uh, background to make um, uh, a color. You could set the, the hue in an HSL function. You could use it unit list with opacity. Um, there's a lot of different things you could do. So let me show you a quick a demo of the example we're going to be working with. Let's uh, zoom in here. So this is just the kind of bootstrap hello world uh, starter template. And I added four progress bars at the top of it um, for no reason at all, really. I just think most sites could benefit from random progress bars that are randomly you know, completed. So these are hard coded, these values, and um, through inline styles. But the goal, once this demo is over, the goal is that when I refresh the page, which I just refreshed a couple of times, and you see nothing changed. But the goal is that every time I refresh it, you'll see a different random value. And that will be, like, that's how we'll know the polyfill is working. So you might be wondering, well, how do you, like, how does this work? How do you tell the browser about a keyword that it doesn't already understand? And um, in JavaScript, you know, it's an imperative language, and you can do things like you can check like, let's say you were checking, does is math.random a function? And if it's not, then you can define it, and you can overwrite these kind of runtime uh, variables um, in the language. But in CSS, you can't really do anything like that. It's completely declarative. You don't have these options. So how does it work to write polyfills? Well, fundamentally, every CSS polyfill kind of does the same thing. It turns code that the browser doesn't understand into code that the browser does understand. So one example would be you have this expression, this calc expression, that has the random keyword. The browser doesn't understand that. And so you want to translate that into an expression it does understand by replacing the word random with just a random number. So we understand that we have to update the CSS. But the question still is, where do you do that? Where is the CSS found? So you've probably heard of the CSS object model. And so that seems like a good place to start. You can find it on document.stylesheets. And it has all of these other um, kind of nested objects, like a style sheet list and style sheet, a rule list, rules, declarations. And you can iterate through this object. And it's mutable, so you can change style properties on the CSS object model. So that seems like a good place to start. Um, this code, if you don't want to read every line, all of my code samples will have a highlighted text. If you don't want to read all of it, you can just look at the highlighted part. Um, what this code is essentially doing, though, is it's, it's looping through document.style sheets for each style sheet, and then it's finding all the nested rules in that style sheet and putting it into a single array, and then it loops through that array. And then for each rule, it looks to see if the property value contains the string random. And if it does, it replaces random with math, the result of math.random. So we can see this working. I'm just going to copy this code, open up a page, open up the web inspector, make it so you can see it, 
clear out this error. Okay, so it ran, but I don't see any random bars on the side. So why would that be? Well, if you look at document.stylesheets, so I have to know that there are three style sheets on this page, and my style sheet is the last one, and it's just the class progress dash bar, and it has the width uh, calc random times 100%. And if we look at the rule list, you can see the CSS text here, and you see in between the curly braces, there's no random value. So there was nothing to replace. Well, you might be wondering why that is. Uh, you probably are aware that in CSS, if the browser encounters something that it doesn't know about, it just drops it. And normally this is a really good thing, because it allows you to run code in old browsers and have it not just fail. But it's really bad for polyfilling, because it means you can't replace something because it's not in the CSS object model. So if it's not there, then where is it? How do we get it? Well, it's not anywhere. We have to search for it. We have to go and we have to find it. Um, there are a couple places CSS could be in a document. It could be in style tags. It could be in link tags with the rel attribute of style sheet. Um, those things you would have to actually uh, do a fetch for them or an AJAX request. Uh, so I, I made this helper function called get page styles. And um, what it does is it does a query selector all for style elements or link rel style sheet elements. It then um, maps over those elements and creates a, a, a promise that you can send a promise that all, and a, each element either returns, if it's um, a link rel style sheet, it does a fetch and returns the response text. If it's a style element, it returns the inner HTML, and it maintains the order because order is important in CSS. And when that's all done, the promise gets fulfilled with um, all that text joined, and then at the end you have the final CSS. So we can do an example of this as well, and we'll run it. This just this creates the function, and so now we can do get page styles, which is going to return a promise, and then the promise is going to um, uh, this code is just going to log the result of the promise to the console. So as you can see, all of this is Bootstrap. I don't know if this is big. So lots of minified Bootstrap code, and then uh, at the very bottom you can see the jumbotron demo Bootstrap code. There are three CSS files, like I said, and at the very very bottom you see our our progress bar with calc random times 100%. So this is working. That's great. Uh, let's move on. So now that we have all the styles on the page, we have a function that can get the styles on the page, what do we do next? Well, the answer is that we have to parse the styles so it can be more easily manipulated. Um, and you might be thinking to yourself, OK, well, the browser has a CSS parser. The browser already parses CSS. Maybe there's some function we can use to parse this code. No, there's no function. As you can see, there are a lot of things that we want to do that the browser is already doing, but that's not available to us as developers. So we have to parse it ourselves. Uh, I don't recommend writing your own parser. There's a lot of open source parsers. CSS is surprisingly complex, the grammar, um, and it's easy to get wrong. It's easy to think you know all of the different possibilities. So I recommend using a parser. So for the rest of this demo, we're going to use post-CSS. Um, so post-CSS, it kind of takes the CSS and it transforms it into uh, an abstract syntax tree. And um, here's an example. This is the CSS on the left, and on the right you have um, a nested object that has different nodes, and each node has a type, so we have like a root node, and then we have rules and declarations. And when you have that, you can kind of iterate through it, and um, you can parse it, you get an object. So in this case, uh, we're you know, just importing post-CSS, we're importing our get page styles function, we're running the get page styles, and then we're just going to log out the abstract syntax tree. So again, let's take a look at what that logged. And essentially just like a bunch of nodes, which is great. You know, like this node, for example, is um, a selector mark. It's a rule, and it's got two declarations inside of it, um, color, and then background. So you kind of get an idea of what that looks like. And then our goal is going to be to kind of iterate through everything. So just to check in, you know, we're about halfway through. Let's see what we've done. Well, so far we've written a lot of code, and so far none of the code we've written has anything to do with our polyfill. We've only done things that kind of boilerplate just to get to the point where we can now think about the polyfill itself. Okay, so moving on. To do, like our to-do list now consists of we have to loop through the abstract syntax tree. Um, we have to go through every declaration, and if it contains the word random, we have to replace it. And once that's done, we have to 
restringify all the styles, remove all the styles on the page, and replace it with our modified styles. Um, Post CSS has a plugin system, which works pretty well for us. Um, that's what the plugin system does. It, it takes an AST, transforms the AST, and then moves it on to the next plugin. In this case, we're going to make our polyfill a Post CSS plugin. And then this is some code that, similar to the get page styles code, it essentially query selector all through the whole document, finds the styles, the link rail style sheet tags, it removes them, and then it creates a new style element, and we set the inner HTML to be the result of our HTML, and then that will update all of CSS on the page. So putting that all together, we have, we're importing all of our helper functions, we're running get page styles, and then we're invoking the post CSS plugin, and then when we're done, we're replacing the page styles. So now we should be done. Okay, let's refresh. So it's kind of working, but that's not really what I wanted. I didn't want randomly to be random, but all of them the exact same random value. And you would expect this, right? You would expect that if you use random keyword in CSS that it would be, you know, even though you know that the selector was progress bar and it was a random value, you kind of expect it to be random per element. So, okay, let's keep going on. We need to figure out how to update our polyfill to target individual elements. So there are a couple ways to do this. They're all bad. A lot of polyfills use option one, and it's the worst one of the options. So we'll discuss it first. Um, you add inline styles to every element matching the selector. So we know the selector, progress bar, we could just loop through all those elements in the DOM and we could add the, um, the new style as an inline element. So this is the code that kind of would do that. And let's check out that demo. Okay, so this kind of works. It does what we want it to do. So we think we're done. But just to be safe, let's see if, let's test it out. Let's see if we can kind of break this code a little bit. So add some more styles, play around with it. Make sure, you know, it passes all of the test cases. If we were writing some tests for this page, we might do something like this, where we, we have a, a style and then we have another style, another rule that comes after it with the same specificity and the same property that references a different value. So you all write CSS, you know what should happen here. Uh, when I refresh the page, I guess I have to open it again. When I refresh the page, oh, do you see what it did there? It started out at 50% like we expected, but then it went to the random value because if we look in the styles and the web inspector, you kind of can see that you know the, the browser knew how the cascade was supposed to work and it did that initially, but then we use inline styles which are more specific than page or than CSS styles, style sheet styles, and so this like doesn't work for us. Um, I consider this to be an unacceptable outcome. You can't write a polyfill that breaks fundamental expectations people have about how CSS works. You couldn't just like put in your README. Oh, by the way, uh, anytime you use random, like just ignore the cascade. It just won't work after that. I mean, that's not really a, a good polyfill in my opinion. So we're going to go to option two. Option two is to check the rest of the CSS for matching rules and then only replace the random keyword with a random number and apply those declarations as inline styles if it's the last matching rule. Wait, that won't work because we have to count for specificity, so we'll have to manually parse each selector and calculate it. Then we can sort the matching rules in specific order from low to high and only apply the declarations for the most specific selector. Oh, and then of course there's media rules, so we'll have to manually check for those matches there as well. And speaking of at rules, there's at supports. Can't forget about that. Uh, lastly, we'll have to account for property inheritance. So for each element, we'll have to traverse up the DOM tree and inspect all of its ancestors to get the full set of computed properties. Oh, sorry, one more thing. We'll also have to account for importance, which is calculated per property instead of per rule, so we'll have to maintain a separate mapping for that to figure out which declaration ultimately wins. <sighs> sounds like a lot of work. It also sounds like something the browser already does for us. And so we would be rewriting the entire cascade just to get our little polyfill to work. Um, you could do that. I don't think it's a very good option. So let's go to option three. This is my favorite option. I've never seen a polyfill do this. I don't recommend it, but I think it's the best of the bad options. Oh, so, so the, sorry, you, the option is to rewrite the, the CSS to target the individual elements, but ensure to maintain the proper cascade order. And here's an example of how you might do that. So the CSS on the left has a paragraph selector that applies opacity random. Now, in this particular document, there are three paragraphs. So we could rewrite the CSS to, well, first we would loop through the DOM and we would find every paragraph and we would give it a unique ID for our polyfill. 
And then we could use an attribute selector to target that individual element, and we could use a unique random opacity value per paragraph. Now, if you're paying close attention, you'll see that this won't work because foo, which comes after it, is now less specific than the rules that we've rewritten. Uh, you know, so that's kind of a problem, but we can get really clever, you know, clever, hacky, whatever you want to call it, and we can rewrite all of the selectors to arbitrarily increase their specificity in a way that doesn't affect what they match by adding a not pseudo class with a, a class that doesn't exist anywhere in the DOM. Feels hacky, but you know, this might work. So here's the code that does that. Uh, I'm a little short on time, so I'm not going to go through all of this, but essentially it kind of does what I just said. It adds a, uh, a data PID attribute to every element and then replaces that element. And then uh, it, it goes through and it adds, um, by the way, all of this code is going to be on GitHub, so if you really want to look at it, you, you can. Um, and then it adds the not selector to all the other selectors. And then we have the final plugin, so let's take a look at it. Okay, so it appears to be working. It's doing the same thing the other ones did. Let's, uh, let's see if we can break it again. Oops. So this is the other one. Now we have to go to the next demo. So this is the same thing we did before. Let's see if that works. This is what we'd expect, because the rule overrode the random, and so it didn't apply um, the random value. Um, and let's, just, let's just do some other things here. Let's just make sure it works. Min width, I don't know, 30M. So now it should only apply in the context of the media query. So that's kind of working too. That's pretty cool. Um, again, like we're not handling the cascade here. The browser's handling the cascade. That's kind of what we want. Um, let's try some other things. Let's do, I don't know, uh, background color. I can spell it, calc random times 360 to get a random hue. We'll go 50% saturation, 50% lightness. For fun, let's also do opacity. Just make that random. Great. Uh, yeah, so now it's, it's doing it. Random opacity, random background color, random width. You know, just for fun, let's do one more thing. Uh, let's do, uh, because I think everyone agrees that what you really need on a web page is random font size. <laughs> so times, let's see, I don't know, 50 pixels. Oh, and since this is a universal selector, let's add importance just to make sure that it always applies. Yeah, I think this is kind of the pinnacle of web design here. <laughs> um, it's all working. So the polyfill works. Everything is perfect. We should all use this technique to write polyfills. Um, what I've done so far is kind of showed you all of the hoops that I had to jump through just to get this really simple idea to work. And it, it's super hacky. I mean, we rewrote every selector on the page, which is not necessarily something that I feel comfortable doing in all situations. Um, but it doesn't, like, that's not, we're not even done. We haven't figured out situations where the DOM changes and we have to rerun the styles. Uh, we didn't handle inline styles. If you wrote random on an inline style on the page, we didn't handle that. We didn't handle shadow DOM. You'd have to loop through every single element and um, update the shadow DOM and run the same thing for each individual element there. Um, we could do those things. It would be hard, but there are things that we can't do. Like, or there's, there's unavoidable problems. I mean, like, this solution requires a lot of code. We pulled in all of PostCSS, which is like a meg of JavaScript. Uh, minified, it's like 200K, but still, you know, not good for just one polyfill. Um, it doesn't work with cross-origin style sheets. So if you have Bootstrap hosted on a CDN and they have an enable course, it just wouldn't work at all um, because you have to do a fetch, and fetch has different um, cross-origin rules than, than CSS. Um, and it performs horribly if you have to make frequent DOM changes. Or like, we, we, like, let's say that we were polyfilling um, position sticky, for example. You have to re-update the styles every time the scroll happens, which would be just, the performance would be really bad. To get an understanding of why the performance is so bad, this is a, a chart from 
the Houdini article I, I referenced, and this is kind of the browser rendering pipeline, and the orange shows where you as developers have access to in JavaScript. And as you can see, you don't have access to the parser, you don't have access to the cast the eight step, or the layout, or the paint, or the composite step. You don't really have much access to the CSF's object model. The only thing you really have access to is the DOM. So if you want to change things, you have to do it kind of through the DOM. So if you have a polyfill, that means you have to force an entire loop around the rendering pipeline. And basically, like, you're forcing a new frame, you're forcing the browser to do recascade, you're forcing it to do a relayout, you're forcing it to do a repaint and recomposite. It's not good for performance. And so if you don't understand yet, like, why Houdini, or at least why I'm excited about Houdini, it's kind of solving this problem. It's allowing us to maybe have a step in, or have access into the layout step, or access into the cascade or the parser step. And it'll give us much more fine grained control and it'll allow us to write performant polyfills, which we can't really do today for all the problems that, that you've seen. So, kind of wrapping up, again, a list of things that the browser already does, but that if we're writing a polyfill, we can't do. We can't fetch the CSS, or we have to do it ourselves. We have to fetch it, we have to parse it, create the CSS object model, we have to handle the cascade in some cases, and we have to deal with invalidating and revalidating styles. And it's a lot of work, and the browser should really do that for us because it already is doing it. We should just have access into that process. Um, and I think some main points to take away are without Houdini APIs, CSS polyfills are inevitably too big, too slow, or too incorrect. You kind of can't have all three of these things. So for some final thoughts, um, without these low-level styling primitives, innovation is always going to move at the pace of the slowest adopting browser. And that's a different browser kind of throughout history, but you always kind of are stuck with whoever's slowest, that's what defines the pace of innovation. And that's not great. We want to put innovation in the hands of web developers so we can push things ahead and not have to wait for browser vendors. Um, developers complain about the pace of innovation in the JavaScript community. It's kind of a thing. You don't really hear about people complaining about it in CSS. You hear the opposite. You hear people saying, oh, I can't use that for like 10 more years. And that kind of you know, sucks. So I think we should change that. I think we should make CSS fatigue a thing. That's all. Here's a link to the slides if you want to look at that later. And if you want to contact me um, or look at uh, the code is on the slides link. And all the demos are up there, all the code is up there. You can run it yourself to make sure I wasn't just faking it. So.